You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop... Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you, and we are glad you're with us. We are going to be continuing our lesson from last week, and so I hope you're ready for that. But before we get into that, we'll give you our content information, how you can reach us. Uh, my name is James Oldfield. My email address is awordfromthelord at gmail.com. 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me. And, of course, if you want to assemble with us, st study the Bible with us, we meet at 250 Boulevard. And Eden, Sundays at 9 a.m., 10 a.m. for worship, uh, Thursday night, 7 p.m. for Bible study. And, uh, of course, if you'd like a copy of this program or anything that we're doing on TV, it, it's uh, free. Just let us let us know how we can assist you and, and help you. We hope that you will contact us uh, and uh, let us know how we can uh, be of service to you. H23 Starting Avenue in Martinsville. If you're uh, in the area, 120 American Legion in Danville. It's how you can assemble with uh uh, the saints there and study the Bible with them and we hope that you will, will do that very thing. <clears throat> uh, Mark's been advertising for me and this is the, the tent meeting that's coming up. The gentleman that called in said he'd been to the tent meeting down at, uh, at the mall before. This, is, uh, this year we're going to be setting up at the Eden Fairgrounds and so we hope that you will make plans to attend that September 14th through the 25th. That's the, that's the Monday after Labor Day. So Labor Day is on the 7th so the next week you have your, your cookout or whatever you want to, are going to be doing on Labor Day, then uh, the next week we're going to be uh, starting the tent meeting, and it's going to be at the Eden Fairgrounds. Hope that you will come out and visit with us. As always, we don't take up any money. We never pass the chicken bucket. We just want you to come out and study God's Word with us. Bring your, bring your Bible. Leave your billfold. Uh, all, those, all those things. Bring your, bring your preacher. Uh, you know, I talked to a lady today, and... Uh, she said, well, I, I'm going to see if Mr. Venerable is going to be available, the preacher down at New Heights Baptist Church. And so, uh, well, you got two weeks to get him ready, two weeks, you know, for uh, uh, give him a heads up, I guess. So clear your schedule, clear your calendar, and, and, and come on out and serve the Bible with us. You know, we welcome people to come in and ask questions. It's a very uh, cordial and, e and uh, friendly environment, contrary to what we usually experience. And so... Uh, which I don't understand that. If you're wanting to ask a Bible question, why would people get defensive? I don't know. But under the tent, you can ask your questions, and uh, we hope that you will come out and <clears throat> study God's Word with us during the tent meeting, September the 14th through the 25th. Okay, tonight on the Word from the Lord, as I said, we're going to continue a, a thought that we started last week. The idea that we, as a nation, are seemingly being guided by a broken moral compass. Now, friends, I know that if you look around, you can see that we are not where we should be as a country. Too much uh, bad things are going on. I talked to a uh, gentleman today, 91 years old, very, very nice, very friendly. I had a good conversation with him. And uh, he was talking about how, how terrible the world is, how, how wicked things are, how mean people are. And, and, and I agree with him. I mean, people... Uh, today, compared to what they were 40, 50 years ago, are, are nothing like they were. Manners and so forth are all, all deteriorating. And so there has to be a reason why. There has to be a reason why people are not as friendly, how you're not as trusting, how, how it is that uh, individuals, you know, are, are always suspect. Why is it that, that uh, we can't trust our fellow man like we used to? Why is it that we can't depend upon them to seek our, our best good or our highest interest? Uh, uh, when, when we meet them, strangers. How, why is that? I submit to you it's because we've got a moral compass that's broken. And by moral compass, we're talking about that, that factor, that standard that tells us what is right and wrong. And last week, what we did, we looked at some of the, uh, uh, some of the criteria of, uh, that, a, that a nation can, can uh, demonstrate or is manifest in a nation whose moral compass is broken. And so the, the fact that we are not willing to discern, that we're, we're not willing to, to point out what the problems are, we're not really to, uh, ready to fix the problems, not willing to fix the problems, is another uh, example of how our, our compass is broken, the direction that we're going to go. You know, the psalmist said that all nations 
uh, will be will be turned to hell that forget God. I'm paraphrasing Psalm uh, 917. But it is the idea that if we as a nation really want to thrive and prosper, you we've got to get back to using the Bible as our moral compass. That will improve our society. And so I know that as we're looking at some of these things, you might say, well, I don't know that that's a problem, but I hope that you can see when we give you statistics and facts and then compare to what the Bible says that you will easily see that, you know what, we are uh, a 180 away from what the Bible is saying. And so I want us to uh, continue that thought process, you know, because moving away from these biblical principles is only going to get us further from God and thus further from the... uh, the life that we really want. You know, we, we want to be able to to say, all right, you know, uh, uh, our, our kids, we can raise our kids in a, in a peaceful environment, and that just doesn't happen anymore. You know, what we, we, ha- we can't uh, uh, trust our kids to be outside without some pedophile or pervert scooping them up and snatching them, carrying them away, and never see them again. And so why is that? We've gotten away from our moral compass. And so if we want a better society, friends, we've got to get back to this book. We've got to get back to this book. Now, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some things that, that, that have indicated that we're, that we're adrift, that our compass is broken, and we really don't know where we're going as a society. Last week, last week, we pointed out two things. We pointed out, number one, the collapse of marriage, and we showed that, you know, the, the family is really the foundation of society. And the fact that, the, that marriage is collapsing, the fact that we are tearing it apart, we're destroying it even more. It's bad enough that homes are ripped up. Uh, uh, mamas and daddies don't live together. Actually, uh, you know, men and women aren't living as husband and wife anymore. They're having children out of wedlock. We gave you all the statistics, how that's deteriorating the family. And then we add to that, we add to that to make matters worse. We, we start giving in to this idea that we can, that man can redefine marriage as two men or two women. And then pretty soon, you know, the pedophile is going to come in and they want to redefine marriage and the, and the, uh, uh, the polygamists want to come in. They're going to re- want to redefine marriage. And pretty soon, our society is going to be even in worse shape than, than it is now because the foundation, the home, the family is going to be so unrecognizable that we won't know which way's up. And so the collapse of the family, the collapse of marriage, the collapse of the home, that is a crucial, a crucial uh, signpost, if you will. It's a marker that says we're in bad shape. Then we talked about the corruption of manners, how that, you know, people are more crude, the uh, bass jokes, you you listen to the songs on the radio and they're more vulgar and more uh, uh, coarse, you know, more graphic uh, on TV. You know, it used to be that the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the wildest, scandalous thing on TV was uh, you know, Fred and Wilma Flintstone sleeping in the same bed. You know, even, you know, I, Lucy and, and, uh, and uh, 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 Desi didn't even sleep in the, in the same bed. You know, they slept in separate beds. But now, you know, now it's, it's gratuitous uh, sex and it's, uh, it's just wherever you turn the TV on. And uh, I've said, and I might have said this before on, on television, what scares me is, you know, you're watching all these, these TV shows that, that are the old, old TV shows, you know, the, the Me TV, Memorable Entertainment, and, and you've got shows on there that are, uh, you know, uh, uh, Emergency and, you know, The Rifleman and, uh, you know, I think wholesome shows that really have some morals and some virtues to them, I suppose. And you get thinking about it, you know, pretty soon the shows that are going to be on Me TV, the classics that are on the, the oldie channel, you know, they're going to be, Friends and Will and Grace and, you know, all these uh, the shows that promote homosexuality, the Ellen DeGeneres show and, and, and so forth. And so those are going to be the classics. And that's scary. That's scary. And it just shows that our, that our manners and our, our behaviors have become uh, coarser and uh, more corrupt. And so it's, it's a very, very sad, sad thing. But here we go. We're going to get another one now. Here's another indication, friends, that, that we have a broken moral compass. I want you to consider this. This is we have created a culture of moochers. Now, I think you know what a moocher is. A moocher is a beggar, someone that's a leech, a parasite that just really, you know, 
sucks off society and sucks the life out of the, the host and doesn't really contribute anything. And that's what we've created. We've created a, a, a culture of moochers. And so that's one of the biggest problems that we face because we have contributed to developing or conditioning people to really accept something that is given to them rather than have them work for it. You know, and I really appreciate the times when I meet individuals and, and talk to individuals. I've uh, come across individuals from time to time, and uh, there's, you know, I, I know some folks that are kind of falling on hard times, and when you try to do something for them, you know, these people, know they don't want it unless they can earn it, unless they can work for it. And I appreciate that because that is, that is not only helping them, but it's helping society. Because anytime someone becomes an individual that is willing to take something for nothing and not do anything in return for it, not provide some sort of trade-off for the goods or, that they're receiving, then you start to see the, the, the moral fabric and the breakdown of society. But that's what we've done. We've created this, this culture of moochers. Now, why would I say that? Why would I say that? Friends, let me tell you something. And I'm just going to give you a few statistics uh, that, that, will end, that will show you what we're talking about. You know, it used to be that when you worked, you were getting a sense of satisfaction that you're providing for yourself, you're providing for your family. And if you were out of work, if you're out of work, you did anything you could to get by. The last thing you did as a very last resort is you ask your family members or maybe you ask uh, the church that you're a member of, but you didn't, you know, you didn't really go ask your neighbor for, for something. You didn't want something for nothing. But our society, but our society has become accustomed to people giving them something. And our society has made it easier for people to take things that really uh, and really don't have any, uh, have to give anything back in return. For example, when you're unemployed, now I understand that when you are uh, when you're employed, you're you know you're paying into this system that you know if you if you're unemployed, you get you get something back, and that's all found well and good. That if you put something, you're basically putting something aside. But friends, do you realize that our government has changed the unemployment benefits, and I'm saying benefits because really I don't know that oftentimes it's always a benefit. I think it's something that it's a, it's a give me rather than something that you've earned. But do you realize that oftentimes they are, are not oftentimes, but do you realize that our government has made the, the unemployment benefits go from 25, 26 weeks to 99 weeks? Now I know we've talked about that before on this program. The fact that our government is actually getting people to be comfortable unemployed. Now, that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. Do you think that people would get used to uh, just receiving these benefits that are, that are given them and, and give up on work? You know, we, we hear this un, these figures about the unemployed, unemployment numbers, are, you know, 5.6%. Friends, that's a lie. That, that's, a false, that's a false indicator. Do you realize that what is being told to you about unemployment in this country is really not taking into consideration the people who have just quit looking for work? And so when you talk about, well, it's a 5.6% unemployment, friends, that's, that's a very, very low unemployment number. But what has happened is more and more people, something like 40 million people, have just stopped looking altogether. And so they don't get counted into the employed number are the, the people who have been hired as, as employed. See that? And so they're not counting those. They don't count in those figures. They don't count the individuals that are uh, just working part-time. Those, those figures are not, are not counted either. When individuals are, are working part-time, they may have two or three even part-time jobs, but those, don't get, those are not told. See, that's not included in the people who have been hired or are, are now employed uh, uh, full-time. And so what you need to realize is that is creating a system, an environment, where people will say, I want to depend on someone else to provide my living or my livelihood for me because it's just too hard. 
Now, friends, I realize that if you don't have a job, if there's not jobs out there, then there's, you know, you're, you're kind of, your hands are kind of tied about what you can do. And so I, I realize that, you know, some of these uh, uh, factors are kind of beyond the control of the people who are unemployed. But here's my point. Here's, here's what scares me, and here is what we're getting at as far as our moral compass being broken. When people don't have a problem getting something for nothing, that affects the entire society. And so what we've done is we've created, we've, we've developed this system where we're going to depend on the government. Friends, the government is not your friend when it comes to providing things. You realize that a government can, that can give you something can take it away and usually will take more than what it ever gives? You say, well, James, what does this have to do with what does it have to do with what the Bible is saying, with our moral compass? What is this, what is it, how does this affect what the Bible is saying? Well, see, God in his infinite wisdom knows that men can be conditioned and they will get used to doing something. And once they get used to doing something, changing is very, very hard. Now that is just, that is a biblical principle that is the case. That's why, that's why the Bible is, is, is uh, uh, talks about th things, uh, let's see, let me get my Bible program up here. When it, uh, it talks about uh, being uh, past feeling, let's see if I can get my fingers to work here. Uh, and now I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, 419, Ephesians 419. Paul said, Who being past feeling have given them so over, over, themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now that's what we're talking about. You can get to a point that you just won't turn around. Now, I know Paul is talking about giving in to sin, and he's talking about, you know, uh, the, the power that sin has over individuals. But it is the principle that works in all facets of life, friends. When you get used to doing something, you don't want to change, even though you may have been doing something differently all this time. But once you get used to something, once you get used to sitting on that couch, once you get used to watching TV all day, you know, once you get used to uh, sitting there eating your bonbons and watching the soap operas and, you know, Jerry Springer, whatever, all day, and then, the, well, let's go back to work. Wait a minute. Boy, I don't really like working. I don't like getting outside and working in the heat. See, it's con you're conditioning yourself. Now, when I, was in, when I was in school, you know, and, and playing sports or whatever, you... Uh, you know, the, the coach gets you out there and gets you run, running in the heat and doing all kinds of drills that will build up your stamina and your endurance. And you know what it's called? It's called conditioning. It's getting you used to an environment that you're going to be playing in all the time. Well, the same thing works in the opposite direction. If you get out of the habit of working, then people then become conditioned to being satisfied with not being employed, they get satisfied with, well, I'm going to live down here. I'm going to live on these little means instead of uh, taking the initiative to improve myself. Now, that is a biblical principle. And we get it in other aspects of life. Look at this. This is a sign. This is a sign in, in a state park. And it says, never attempt to feed the animals they are wild creatures with natural diets and should not be made dependent on handouts. Now, friends, we recognize that when you go into the state park. Don't feed the bears. Don't feed the wild animals. They will become dependent upon handouts, and they won't go out and forage for themselves. But yet our government says, you know what? If you... If you can't find a job in 26 weeks, we're going to extend that to 99 weeks. Friends, think about that. That's nearly two years. In two years, you can get accustomed to saying, hey, I'm going to get something from the government. I'm going to, I'm going to be content to, to do nothing. And then 
what happens. See, then you're satisfied with even, even less. Now, here's the scary thing, friends. And this, is, this is this compass. 52% of Americans receive some benefits from the government. Now, don't write me letters. Somebody's going to call them with hate and say, you just hate them. No, listen. I recognize that people who have paid into Social Security, Medicare, whatever, they deserve everything they're going to get out of that if they, if they get anything out of it. You know, you paid into the system, or you should get out. You should get it back out. But, friends, there's a lot of people that are getting stuff out of the system that have never paid anything in. 52% of people are getting something from the government. Now think about this. If 52% of the people, that's over half, are getting something from the government, what happens if the government says, okay, now the benefits for you have run out? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, 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 need, to, I need to get mine. Or maybe I want to get it because I've always gotten it, whether it's yours or not. See, it's that, it's that uh, a cycle of dependence. Now, friends, you know, I don't have a problem people having Social Security, but you know what? There has to be something more to it than that. The Bible says that you ought to provide for your own. And when people, Social Security was never de designed to be the, the, uh, uh, the, under, the, the, the safety net for everybody, or at least they shouldn't have looked at it that way. Maybe that's what the, the individuals that uh, started it wanted to be where people would be dependent upon the government. But it should have been the fact that people say, you know what? Why should I give the government my money in order for the government to give it back to me in the end? Why would you want a third party or a second party to hold your money and then say, all right, now, now you give it back to me when I retire? I, I, I don't know that I want to give the government my money and trust that they're going to give it back to me in the end. See that? So it's about personal responsibility. It's about personal responsibility. Now, here's what the compass says. Here's what the compass says. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, and I want you to, I want you to listen to this. We're going to look at the context here. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. Paul says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the, after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how that ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Now, Paul is going to give an example of someone behaving disorderly. Or he's going to contrast that with the way he behaved. And he said, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Now Paul says, look, here's our behavior. We followed the Bible, and we even went to the point that we made sure that we provided for our own things so that we would not be chargeable to any of you. You know what chargeable means? It means to be a heavy burden upon, to be an expense upon. Paul says, we provided for our own selves so that we wouldn't say, uh, hey, brother, you know, brethren over here in Thessalonica, why don't you, why don't you help me, you know, let, let, give me something, give me something, give me something. Now, Paul could have. You know, he said he had to write as, as a minister of the gospel, deliver the gospel. But he said, here's the thing, we labored uh, and, and travailed night and day that we might not be charged with any of you. Now, notice this. Not because we have not power. So he said, we, we could have. We could have insisted that you help us some. He said, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Now, friends, here's the, here's the biblical principle that we've gotten away from. See, the compass says if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. But yet, where are we today? Today, we have a society that says, well, I'm not going to work, but yeah, I'm still eating. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people who aren't working, able to work. Listen, able to work, and they eat pretty good. They eat pretty good. So what are we saying? 
we've, we've gotten away from, from, from this. We've gotten away from the principle. Listen, if you tell someone, you know what, if you don't work, you're not going to get, gonna get your, 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 your wick or your snap or whatever it's called. If you don't have some sort of accountability, guess what? You're not going to get it. Now, friends, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you, if you come ask me for money, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, you got money for beer, you got money for cigarettes, you got money for tattoos, you got money for pedicures, manicures, earrings, nose rings, whatever kind of piercings, you got money for all that? Uh, you got more money than I do. You have more disposable income than I do because I don't have money for all that. And if I did, I wouldn't use it. I'd use it for something productive. See that? But what we've done, we've created a society. We've created a society that says, hey, I want the government to give me something, something for nothing. Now, here's what Benjamin Franklin said. He said when people find that they can vote themselves money, and that's what they're doing, they're voting for people who will give them something in return, he said that will be the end of the republic. Friends, something for nothing. You know, the Bible actually would say that's stealing. That's stealing. Friends, if you are able to work and you're getting something from the government, you just need to remember this. If you're getting something for the government that you didn't give to the government to give back to you, the government took that from somebody else and gave it to you. And if you wouldn't ask, if you wouldn't ask the person that the government took it from, if you could have that money, they'd probably say no. But because the government took it from them, they'll give it to you. Now, friends, we get away from the biblical principle, and we're in, in dire straits here. We're in dire straits here. See, the compass says you ought to provide for your own and provide for your own family. Look at this. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 3, 1 Timothy 5, verse 3. Actually, let's... Uh, let me get back. Let's finish this right here. Paul said, For we hear that there uh, are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. When, you, when you're busy, friends, you don't have time to get into trouble. He says, Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with all quietness they work and eat their own bread. Not somebody else's. Not somebody else's. Friends, if it's not yours, it doesn't belong to you, why would you take it? Why would you take it? And yet, you'll do the same thing, or we'll do, we let people do the same thing in our society. We let them have things that they didn't earn, that they didn't work for. And it's, and it's ruining our society. We're getting away from the compass. Compass is broken. Now, here's what Paul says in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 3. Now, I want you to look at this. This is a good illustration of how to take care of people, care for those in need, and make sure that everybody's cared for. He says, honor widows that are widows indeed. This is 1 Timothy 5, 3. Now, he's going to tell us what widows indeed are. He said, if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home to require their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now look what he says. He says, you need to take care of widows indeed. But if, if, if there's a widow that has children or nephews, she's got some family, extended family, they need to learn to take care of her. They need to take care of their own house. And he says, now, she that is a widow indeed, now he, he gives a definition of the widow indeed, the one that the church is going to be chargeable for. She that is a widow indeed and desolate, trusteth in God, continueth in supplication and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Now notice the contrast here. One is a widow indeed. One is, is not. These things give, uh, give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own and especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now you see the principle here? The principle that the Bible is giving us that we've gotten away from our society is you provide for your own. You take care of your own first. That's the first obligation. All right? 
He says, let not a widow be taken into the number. Now, he's talking about the church being chargeable. He says, look, here is how you, here's how you tell who the church is chargeable for and who's not. He says, let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of good works, if she had brought up children, if she had lodged strangers, if she had washed the saints' feet, if she had relieved the afflicted, if she had diligently followed every good work. All right, those are the individuals that you take care of. He says, but the younger widows refuse. You don't help them. You don't take them in and you provide for their needs. For when they begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, and having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with them they learn, now watch this, they learn to be idle, wandering from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some have already turned aside after Satan. Now, keep reading here. He says, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that they, be, that they may relieve them that are widows indeed. Now, here's the gist of what he just said. If you have a family member who needs to be cared for, you care for them. All right? Everybody cannot be cared for. Everybody cannot ex accept, expect the church to care for everybody. All right? Now, friends, if that's a principle that Paul is saying for the church, everybody cannot be provided for. Only specific people can be provided for. Don't you think that that might just work, say, on a national level? when it comes to government. See, I don't have a problem with the government helping specific people who just cannot be helped any other way, who don't have any other recourse. But friends, let me tell you something. There's a whole lot of able-bodied people that are getting a whole lot from the government and all they're doing is they're just, they're just mooching. They're sucking the resources up from those that really need it. Now, again, Paul said there's some people that the church should not help. And you know what? There's some people that the government should not help either. They did, the government just shouldn't help them. Look, if, you, if you're getting money from the government, you know what? I think you ought to take a drug, drug test. Some of these, state, some of these states that are, that are saying, look, if you're going to get money from, from the public, from all your neighbors out there, you know what? We need to make sure that you're not spending the money you do have on drugs. Now, that's, that's a legitimate request. But we don't do that, see? Anybody walks in, they can sign up for, you know, government assistance, and boom, hey, you know, just check the box and be sure you vote for the guy that made it possible for you to get that, that, that little check. No, friends, that's a, that's a problem. We're broken. We're getting away. We're getting away from what, what the compass is saying, the direction the compass is pointing out. The compass is pointing us into this direction. The compass is pointing us for people to work so that they can help others. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands a thing which is good that he may have to give to him that, to him that needeth. People who work and earn what they have are typically more generous in giving. Do you realize that? But the people who, who always take and take and take, they're the least generous because that's not really theirs to start with. Now, you think about that, friend. Think about that. See, I, we're, not, we're not following the, the compass the way the Bible says. We, we've created a whole society. We've created a whole society of moochers. You know? We, we've become a whole society of wimpy. You know who wimpy is? You know uh, Popeye's uh, sidekick or the guy's always, you know, I'll be glad to pay you a for a hamburger today? No. 
Our, our society says, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to pay you never for a hamburger every day. I'm not going to pay you anything. Just give me the hamburger. See, we, we have this, this society of moochers that insist that, you know what? They deserve, they think they deserve something just because they exist. You know? Yeah, well, society of moochers. That's where we are. That's where we are. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what the compass says. Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. But he that increaseth by labor shall increase. But he that gathereth by labor shall increase. You work and you earn what, you, what you've uh, 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 worked for. You build something with your own hands. You accomplish something with your own sweat and blood. And you know what? You'll increase. Proverbs 14, 23. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Penury. You know what? That's poverty. That's an old word for destitution. Poverty. Talk is cheap. But if you get out there and do something, friends, there's profit in it. There's benefit to it. But we've gotten away from that. We've stopped insisting that people work for what they get. And the result is we've created this culture of, of mooches. Culture of mooches. All right. Well, you've got the collapse of marriage, right? You've got the corruption of manners. You've got a culture of mooches. Moochers. And then we've got the consent to murder. Friends, I know I talked about this a couple weeks ago. But I want you to think about this, seriously. Here's how we know we are going backwards fast. We have a society that is willing to concede it's okay to murder. You know, oh... A couple weeks ago, this, this old line down here, wherever he was, Kenya or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, somebody killed him. Cecil Cecil the line. He was killed. Oh, I can't believe we killed this line. Oh, he was so great and pretty, you know. And all the while, the line has been shot. All the while, the line has been shot. You know what? We didn't hear anything about the killing of people. Then here recently, just yesterday, I guess it was, you know, People talking about this, how crazy this man was. Shot these two uh, news people, TV crew, right up, right up the road, run over Virginia. And that's terrible. That, that, I, I just I couldn't believe it. But you know what? Where is the shock and where is the outrage for all the stuff that's going on in our society behind the scenes that no one has ever seen until now? You know, here's what I'm talking about. There's another, another Planned Parenthood video has come out. And friends, I want to show, I want to play this one for you. And it's, it's, it's a little lengthy. But I want to show you to you. It's, it's, and I'm going to tell you right now, if you've got, you know, weak stomach, whatever, there's some parts in here that you're probably not going to watch if you hadn't eaten supper or whatever. But it ought to shock you. It ought to make you sick at what our society is tolerating. All right? Now, this is, this is another undercover video of Planned Parenthood, and I want you to listen closely. Example, so I had eight cases, cases yesterday, and I knew exactly what we needed, and I kind of looked at the list, and I said, all right, this 17-weeker has eight grams, and this one. So I knew which were the cases that were enough? probably more likely to heal what we needed, uh, and I made my decision. According to that too. It's worth having a huddle at the beginning of the day. Uh-huh. And that's what I do. And I'm just gonna step off the screen because it's gonna run a little while. I never did, but I think I've witnessed some of the other technicians um, work with the doctors. I remember I was on my day off and I went on my laptop and and popped up and they were working and I saw a message saying that the doctor had uh, aborted a fully intact fetus. Fully intact. And, they, and Sem Express was sending it straight to the lab. 
Now, I uh -huh. literally have had um, women come in and they'll go in the OR and they're back out in three minutes. And I'm going, what's going on? Oh yeah, the fetus was already in the vaginal canal whenever the, we put her wow. in the stirrups, it just fell out. Yeah, and so if we alter our process mm -hmm. and we are able to obtain intact fetal cadavers, then we can make it part of the budget that any dissections are this and splitting the specimens into different shipments is mm. this. I mean, that's, it's all just a matter of line items. Mm -hmm. Usually they want both hemispheres intact with the brain stem, which usually doesn't happen. They'll take like an 80% intact or 70% intact, but you have to contact them and see if that would be okay. We've got a rate limiting step on the procedure is calvarium. Calvarium, the head is basically the biggest part. Most of the other stuff can come out intact. Right. It's very rare to have a patient who doesn't have enough dilation to evacuate all the other To bring the, so, to bring the body cavity out exactly. and protect all that. And with the calvarium, in general, some people will actually try to change the uh, presentation so that's not vertex. So when it's a vertex presentation, you never have enough dilation in the beginning of the case unless you have a real huge amount of dilation to deliver an intact calvarium. So if you do it starting from the breach presentation, there's dilation that happens as the case goes on and often the last you can evacuate the intact calvarium. Mm -hmm. So I mean there are certainly steps that can be taken. So they can to convert to, to breach, sure. for example, exactly. at the start of the exactly. I was training with Jessica in the Alameda and I've been doing it for a few weeks so I kind of knew what I was doing but kind of not and I was really busy and one of the doctors came in and she looked really frustrated the medical assistants were with her and I don't know, it was my deal to listen and see what's going on and the doctor just says if she can't calm down I can't do the abortion like and I can't medicate her Something, something like that, and she was just distraught. The other thing that plays a tremendous part in this all is um, <clears throat> the dilation exactly. that you've obtained, exactly. and also um, whether how lack of a better word how cooperative the patient mm -hmm. is during the procedure. Finally, the woman she calmed down, and the doctor went in to confirm perform the abortion. It takes a little while. And I'm in the hallway, I see the jar come out, goes into the, the path lab, and Jessica, I can hear, is preparing it, so rinsing out the jar, rinsing out the linen the wrapping that catches it, dumping it in the strainer, rinsing it off, putting water in the pie dish, and getting it ready for the doctor. So then I hear her call my name, hey Ollie, come over here, I want you to see something kind of cool, it's kind of neat. So. I'm over here and this is, the moment I see it, I'm just flabbergasted. This is the most gestated fetus and This might be where you want to turn the channel I've if seen. you got a weak stomach. And she's like, okay, I want to show you something. So she has one of her instruments and she just taps the heart and it starts beating. And I'm sitting here and I'm looking at this fetus and its heart is beating. And I don't know what to think. Is there still circulation in the heart once you isolate it? So, uh, you know, the, so there are there are times uh, when uh, after the procedure is done that the heart actually is still beating. They induce fetal demise at about 20 weeks, 18 to 20 weeks, and so they uh -huh. inject digoxin into the fetus. Right, right. I was actually going to ask about it because I want to make sure there's no digoxin. No, on no, my no, 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 no. <laughs> Providers who use digoxin use it for one of two reasons. There is a group of people who just use it so that they have no risk of violating the Federal Abortion Act. If you induce the demise before you do the procedure, nobody's going to say you did a live, whatever the, mm. the federal government calls it, yeah. partial birth abortion. Whenever you're talking about fully intact fetuses in the context of fetal tissue procurement, those are situations where no feticide, like a like digoxin or potassium chloride, no chemical like that can be used to kill the fetus beforehand because that poisons the organs and the tissues. Yeah. And so in that case, it's prima facie evidence of born alive infant cases. And she's like, you know why that's happening? And I knew why it was happening. It's because the electrical current was the nodes were still firing. And I don't know if that constitutes it's technically dead or it's alive. It had a face. 
it wasn't completely torn up. And its nose is very pronounced. It's it had eyelids, and its mouth was pronounced. And then, since the fetus was so, so intact, she said, "Okay, well, this is a really good fetus, and it looks like we can procure a lot from it. Um, we're gonna procure brain." So, I, the moment I hear something, like, that means we're gonna have to cut the head open. We're gonna have to cut. So, it's like, okay, so what you do is you go through the face. I'm thinking, no, I don't want to do this. And she takes the scissors and she makes a small incision right here. And goes, I would say, to maybe a little bit through the mouth. And she's like, okay, can you go the rest of the way? And I'm like, yes. And I didn't want to do this. And so she gave me the scissors and told me that I have to cut down the middle of the face. And I can't even like describe like what that feels like. And I remember picking it up and finishing going through the rest of the face and Jessica picking up the brain and putting it in the container with the media and parafilming it and she left and she's like okay you can clean it up and I'm just I'm just sitting there like what did I just do and that was the moment I knew I couldn't work for the company anymore and I, that was still it was even if it's going to be good if that could have been the cure for some kind of disease then I wish even if it was I wish I still wouldn't have done it I don't want to be that person and I remember picking, it was a male, I remember picking him up with the gloves because it was too, it was too heavy. The pie dish was this and he was big, like the pie dish and I couldn't like take it and put it in the strainer and put it in, like I couldn't, it was just too big. And I opened the biohazard container and it's almost full, like it's almost full. I'm holding him in my hands and like, oh my God, it's just, what am I doing? And I take him, I put him in, and I remember he got stuck on the lid. And it turned around and his buttocks was in the air and his two feet were like dangling out. And I remember having to pick each one of his feet up and put him in the container and close the lid. And that was the hardest experience I've had. I remember holding that fetus in my hands when everybody else was busy and started crying and opened the lid and put it back in. It's just really hard knowing that you're the only person who's ever going to hold it that baby. It's weird because I always think of all these scenarios could happen. Like, I held it, I'm like, man, this, this could have grown up to be... And I always, I always think about things like that, like if this could be a lawyer, this could be a firefighter, this, this could be the next president, like I wonder what, because you can tell the sex sometimes, like I wonder if this, like what it would like, like I can't imagine like, I wonder at age three if, you know, she would like to color, or things like that, you know, I wonder what it would look like, her mom or her dad, or things like that, I feel like it's a waste of life. Like, and it's sad that so many people view it as a mistake. You know, because it's, it's not. I mean, life isn't a mistake. I mean, getting pregnant can, it, it can be an accident, but it's not a mistake. Okay, folks, so there you have it. Our society, selling baby parts, shipping baby parts, you know, that's, that's what we're talking about here. And yet, where's the, where's the moral outcry? Where's the outrage? You know, we're, we're all concerned and worried about a dumb line. 
We're worried about all kinds of animals, but we're killing our own children. What's wrong with our society? You mean to tell me that that's, that's, that's normal? That's a appropriate behavior? I mean, why is it that we can't see that the compass is broken? Listen, Exodus 21, 22. All right, we'll take this. You're on the word from the Lord. Hi, James. But you're right. The compass is broken. It's not only broken, it's just it's crushed. Uh, it's, it's just smashed to smithereens. We got people in society nowadays that has their young kids around, take them around where vulgar language is being said or something, and they won't even say, hey, look, there's children around here, kids around here. So then they expect their child to be right or do right in society, but that's where they're brought up and they're taught. Well, the children, I've heard, I've heard children use worse language than adults, so, but yeah, you're right. You know, we don't have any care, any concern for them. And like you said, TV nowadays, they can get any of that language right. off TV. That's right. And it's, it's a shame. I, I, I see it each and every day, and I, I think of my own, too. And it's, it's a pitiful world we live in. I know you're getting close to your program. I, I'll let you go, but All God right. bless you. All right. Thanks for your call. All right. So, so friends, the, the, do you think God's going to hold us guiltless? Exodus 21 verse tw and 22. Exodus 21, 22. The law of Moses said, If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, uh, and he, will, he shall pay as the judges determine. So if two men are fighting, and one of them hurts the, the woman that's with child. Now, there is an accountability for the loss of that life. But yet, here in the good old USA, boy, I mean, we're, 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 we're losing the, the fruit of the womb all the time. And no one's blinking an eye. Our, our, our Congress can't even... See, get to themselves to, to defund it. How callous are we? Let me tell you, friends, we don't have any, we don't have any right, our country, we don't have any right to talk about human rights of other countries. Yeah, in China, they kill, they kill infants all the time, too. Sure do. Yeah, all these uh, communist countries, Dictators, yeah, they, they kill they kill thousands. ISIS over here cutting people's heads off. That's right. But how do we get to say, how do we get to hold the moral high ground and say all of that's wrong when we've got people that are so callous that they're talking about shipping the calivarium. Let's let's make it a very technical term so that we don't have to say the baby head. We're talking about shipping baby heads across the country and we want to think we've got the moral high ground? Oh, no. No. Our comp's broken. It's broken. Now, I mean, are you, will you do something to, to help stop it? I mean, here's the number. Call your congressman. Call your senators. Say, look, we, we, we've got to stop this. And just mind you, friends, we're going to pay the consequences. I mean, we, we've, got, we've got to pay the consequences for all of this innocent blood that's been shed. Don't think that we can say, well, Lord, let's, let's stop it and, you know, now everything's good. No, we're going, we're going to be punished for it. But surely we can stop any more from going, from happening. So where, where's our compass? It's broken. Our compass is broken. And we've got to turn it around. Now, friends, next week, I'm going to tell you why all of this is happening. What, what, what's brought on the collapse of marriage? What's brought on the corruption of manners? Why is it that we've become a culture of moochers and a, a culture that is consenting to the murder of innocent, unborn children? I'm going to tell you why. Next week, next week, the last point, why 
we are on the decline. And it's one really simple problem, one really simple answer as to why we're on the decline and why our, our moral compass is broken. Friends, I'm out of time, so I'm going to wrap up. I just want to say to you that I appreciate you watching. And if I can help you in any way, I want to do that very thing. My, my number is 276-340-2653. You want to know why, know what's going to help our country? You need to make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Tune in next week. Hope to see you then.